intravenous for 21 days. Right. So I'll just take up now the last talk of uh, today's session. And uh, we can't have a uveitis session without talking about steroids. I think uh, they play an extremely important role. So I'll just uh, take up this topic of how to use steroids smartly in a patient of uveitis. So uh, no one is really allowed to die or go blind without a trial of steroids. And I think it is a very valid saying when we are dealing with patients of uveitis that we cannot declare the patient as non-responsive till we have not tried or corticosteroids. So once you have ruled out infection or malignancy, ocular inflammation is the principal cause of complications in most of the patients. And the control of inflammation is very much the primary goal of managing any patient of uveitis. And it apparently is like a firefighting to control the ocular inflammation as early as possible. The other goals, of course, being of the treatment is to have an early control of inflammation, but with minimal side effects, to prevent a permanent damage to the ocular structures, and also to prevent long-term visual loss in our patients. There can be various modalities of giving corticosteroid therapy, one of course being the systemic steroid therapy, the second being a local steroid therapy, which can be given in the form of posterior subti non transdermal injections, uh, intravitreal implant of dexamethasone, which is commonly known as Ozodex. We do also have other implants in the form of flucinolone acetonoid implant, which comes in the trade name of Reticert. And flucinolide acetonoid implant, again, is, uh, which is known as Illuvian. Now, recently, people have also started treating uveitis patients with a supracoroidal transylon depot injection. So coming to systemic therapy with corticosteroids in uveitis, we do have an induction phase and a suppression phase, where the induction phase mainly is the initial phase of control of active inflammation and it is very much applicable to all the cases of inflammation. It has to be done as early as possible. And we do not have to give the corticosteroids in a lesser dosage. It is extremely important that when we are starting to treat a patient of uveitis, it has to be given in a full dosage. As far as the maintenance of control of inflammation is concerned in chronic inflammatory diseases, it has to be done after we have achieved a successful induction. For chronic severe diseases, long-term suppressive therapy is the key to a long-term success, and also we have to avoid any kind of a recurrence. Now, what are the indications of using systemic corticosteroids? So one would be a chronic bilateral disease where you want the effect to happen in both the eyes, and this is primarily when the uveitis is involving the posterior segment beyond the anterior segment involvement. When we are not getting any response to a local therapy, the eye diseases associated with systemic diseases, again, we would think of systemic steroids, and a severe inflammation that is too painful or is likely to cause a destruction of the ocular structures is the time we will opt for systemic corticosteroids. So typically we will start with an initial dose of one milligram per kg uh, per day. The maximum adult oral dose may go up to as high as 80 milligrams per day. And a maintenance dose is usually varying between 7.5 to 10 milligrams per day. As far as the tapering schedule is concerned, I don't think that it is a very mechanical process. And we apparently taper our corticosteroids depending upon the response that we see clinically when we are doing a follow-up of our patients. However, it's extremely important with systemic steroids that we monitor the patient for various systemic side effects, such as blood pressure, the weight gain, the glucose levels, which are very important. And the patients who are borderline diabetics or diabetics, they have to be very closely monitored. The lipid levels have to be monitored. The bone density has to be again monitored, especially within the first three months and then thereafter annually. We also have to give supplements such as calcium, and vitamin D3 are usually given along with corticosteroids. 
As far as the oral corticosteroids in children are concerned, a short-term oral steroids are acceptable, but not long-term because of the various side effects which can hamper the growth in the children. The early use of immunosuppression is indicated in children, so the acute phase of uveitis will be managed by giving oral corticosteroids, but a very quick shift over to immunosuppressant drugs, such as amethotrexate, is very much warranted while we are dealing with children with uveitis. Growth monitoring, again, is very crucial if we are contemplating a long-term therapy with steroids, and usually corticosteroid therapy has to be done along with the, uh, you know, in alliance with a pediatrician or a rheumatologist who can take care of the systemic side effects. Now, I'll just briefly touch upon this interesting case of a 61-year-old female patient who presented with pain and floaters in the left eye for last three days. The right eye had a vision of 6, 9, and 8, and there was a yellowish mass in the supranasal quadrant with exudative retinal detachment and a dilated conjunctival vessels over it. I'm sorry, she presented with pain and floaters not in the left eye, but in the right eye for last three days. And what we typically see is this yellowish mass lesion in the supranasal quadrant. And when we did the optical coherence tomography passing through the macular area, it did show the subretinal fluid suggestive of exudative retinal detachment. And you also had the undulations of the ocular layers. We did an ultrasound B scan and which was very much suggestive of exudative retinal detachment. However, there was also an element of a T sign, though it was not very distinctive. We did go ahead and do a fundus fluorescein angiography, which showed a hot disc, suggestive of an inflammatory pathology. There was a lot of RPE alterations. And we did get a diffuse hyperfluorescence in the supranasal quadrant where we were seeing the yellowish discolored mass. The presumptive diagnosis made was of a nodular posterior scleritis with exudative retinal detachment. All the investigations were done and the patient was started on oral corticosteroids. At two weeks follow up, we find that there was a beautiful resolution of the exudative retinal detachment. The patient had recovered a vision of 6, 9, N6, and the patient was extremely asymptomatic, not having any pain, and was responding to the treatment very well. This is a 24-year-old female patient with diminution of vision in the left eye for last five days, already on treatment with antitubercular drugs for pulmonary tuberculosis, her CECT was suggestive of fibro fibroparenchymal lesion in the left upper lobe and calcified lymph nodes bilaterally suggestive of an active TB infection. Her mantux was very strongly positive. Now, when you see the left eye fundus, you do see a large granuloma, which is involving the supranasal quadrant. And you see these typical petechial hemorrhages, very clinical, very classical of a tubercular granuloma. You also see that there is an involvement of the optic nerve head, and you do have an optic nerve head granuloma. On OCT passing through the lesion, you do see the involvement of the overlying retinal layers, which again is very much suggestive of a TB granuloma. There was evidence of cystoid macular edema in the macular area. And we have done this study where we have treated the TB granulomas very successfully by giving intravitreal injections of Avastin, and moxifloxacin, and we get a beautiful regression of the entire TB granuloma within a few weeks' time. But subsequent to the regression of the entire TB granuloma, we saw an enlargement of this lesion on the temporal side, which initially was not present, suggestive of a paradoxical reaction. And here on this paradoxical reaction was then treated with intravenous methylprednisolone, and you see that the patient responded responded very well. Our study also evaluated the VEGFA levels in these patients and found that there were VEGF levels were extremely high in these patients of TB granuloma, mounting to as high as three times, which are found in patients with AMD CNBM. So this is the timeline of this patient, starting with the vision of 636N12, responding to the intravitreal injections of moxifloxacin and avastin, and beautifully recovering a vision of 66N6, but what is important for us to know is that we need to recognize a paradoxical reaction, which again responds to a very high dose of intravenous corticosteroids in this particular patient. 
Coming to local steroid therapy, the indications are non-infectious uveitis in adults, pediatric uveitis, a patient not responding to systemic therapy, and if we have contraindications to using systemic corticosteroids, such as pregnancy, diabetes, or any kind of a psychiatric illness. The side effects of local corticosteroid therapy, we very well know, can be an increase in intraocular pressure or a cataract formation, which can be rather devastating to a young patient uh, being given local therapy. So this is the 33-year-old male patient. He had a history of trauma with an iron particle eight days back, followed by diminution of vision, and he underwent a corneal tear repair elsewhere. The diminution of vision in the right eye was for last one day, and which was not the eye which had seeked the trauma. So the vision in the right eye had dropped to 612, while the vision in the left eye, which had got the trauma, was as low as hand movements. On a slit lamp examination, there was evidence of anterior chamber cells in the right eye, which was the sympathizing eye. And the left eye, you could see the corneal sutures were in place. There was evidence of posterior synechia formation and, of course, the traumatic cataract. The patient underwent an intraocular foreign body removal in the left eye. However, in the right eye for last one day, where he had a diminution of vision, on fundus fluorescein angiography, you see that there was evidence of the small punctate leakage, which was seen on fundus fluorescein angiography. So you can sometimes get this kind of a presentation, which we have reported, which is a little atypical presentation of sympathetic in ophthalmia, only involving the posterior segment. We did an OCT, which again was suggestive of a serous detachment. And this patient was treated with intravenous methylprednisolone for three days, followed by oral corticosteroids. And subsequently, he was treated with azothioprine, which was continued for literally a year. So this is how the patient responded. And in two months, he had gained a vision of 6-6-N6. And since this was the only seeing eye of the patient, he did extremely well, and we were able to salvage this uh, eye. Now, the only problem in this patient was, as you see, that at four weeks follow-up, the patient had recovered a vision of 612, but was still continuing to have a very, uh, you know, small pocket of subretinal fluid in the macular area. And this is the time when we decided to inject an Ozodex implant in this patient, along with continuation of systemic steroids and azathioprine. And again, the patient showed a beautiful response at two months with a vision recovery to 66N6 after the Ozodex implant. Now, moving on to my next patient, a 23-year-old boy with pain and redness in both the eyes for the last three to four months. There was a history of lymph node multidrug-resistant tuberculosis diagnosed 10 years back, and he had already taken a treatment for three years. And there was, however, no treatment record available, so we don't know what all drugs were given at that time. The patient had a vision of 66N6 in both the eyes. There was evidence of vitreous cells. He was started on tablet Visalon in tapering dose along with lotipred eye drops. We went ahead and did a fundus fluorescein angiography and also we did an OCT. Now this patient apparently showed both healed lesions and active lesions in the right eye, while in the left eye there was evidence of extensive healed choroditis patches. Now the problem was that despite being on all the treatment, that is ADT, corticosteroids, the patient continued to have these active lesions in the right eye. And they were approaching the macular area, threatening the vision of this patient. So at this time, we decided to give an Ozodex implant. You see the implant in the upper image. And you see that there was a beautiful regression of these active lesions in the right eye. Now, this is a pregnant female patient in her third trimester with a diminution of vision in the right eye for last one week. The vision was as low as 660 with a few vitreous cells. And when we did a fundus fluorescein angiography, the angiography was very much suggestive of a VKH in this disease. There was a typical pattern which was seen on OCT, which again confirmed the diagnosis. And since she was a pregnant female, we avoided uh, using the systemic corticosteroids in this patient. And that is why we opted for giving an intravitreal Ozodex injection. And you see that there was a beautiful response in this patient on giving an Ozodex injection. Now, since this patient was uh, in her third trimester, after she delivered, we started her on immunosuppressive therapy to avoid a recurrence of the disease. 
So there are certain principles to remember for smartly using the corticosteroids in uveitis patients. One is that we must assess what is the type of uveitis that we are dealing with. We must rule out infectious uh, underlying etiology and also that we may have any kind of a malignancy which may be masquerading as a cause of uveitis. And then it would be very disastrous to start these patients on, U on corticosteroids, which may actually mask the underlying etiology. The third principle would be to hit hard and hit fast. And this is the induction phase with full dose of corticosteroids to control the eye inflammation as early as possible. And this is basically to avoid an ocular structure damage. The maintenance therapy with steroids or immunosuppressants are very important for chronic uveitis patients to avoid long-term complications and also to avoid a recurrence of active inflammation. We have to use steroids judiciously with monitoring of the systemic side effects because we know that the systemic corticosteroids can have very severe systemic side effects. As far as the pediatric age group is concerned of uveitic patients, we have to have an early shift to immunosuppressants or we can opt for a local steroid therapy, but the systemic steroids have to be given for a very short duration to avoid a, a, you know, a damage to their growth pattern. We should consider the local therapy, and that is extremely important. Wherever the systemic uh, corticosteroids are contraindicated, such as diabetes or in pregnancy. Thank you so much for your patient listening. Thanks a lot for the enlightening talk and nicely you covered.